Hey guys, Alex here from Blender Academy. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to be dead accurate when modeling in Blender. You already know Blender can be an amazing tool for quick and creative visualizations and conceptual designs. But if you're like most of my students when they're first getting started, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, that's great, but what if I need to be completely accurate and precise with my dimensions and placement as I'm modeling? The good news is, Blender can function with pinpoint accuracy when you need it to. You just need to know a few tips and tricks to use along the way. That's why I've compiled this list of the seven key things you need to do to model with precision and accuracy in Blender, which I'm about to share with you. Starting with number one, set your units. When you open a new file in Blender, you'll see a grid. That grid is based on the file's units. By default, each grid square is one meter by one meter. But maybe you work in feet and inches, or you work in metric units, but you tend to work at centimeter or millimeter level scale. You can change the units by going to your scene properties on the right and clicking units. First, set the unit system. Then, if needed, change the base unit length being used. When you change the unit system, you'll see the grid adjust so that each grid square equals one unit of length. Now, keep in mind that if you change the length setting, it will impact the default units you'll specify when doing things later in Blender. For example, moving an object a value of 5 will be 5 meters by default. But if you change the length value, it will be 5 units of whatever you set the length to. You can change the units whenever you want within the file you're working on, and you can change them to different values with each new file. And here's a quick bonus tip. If you want to change the default units so every new Blender file will open with your preferred settings, open a new file, set the unit system and unit length, then go under File, Defaults, and pick Save Startup File. Just note that it'll save everything you've changed in the default file, including any other settings you edited and objects you have in your scene. All right, once you have your unit set, you're ready to start using them to create more accurate 3D models. That brings us to our next tip. Number two, specify dimensions using object properties. If you watched our Getting Started with Blender video, you've learned the very basics of creating and transforming 3D models. If you haven't watched that video yet, pause this video and go check it out. I'll wait. All right, now let's talk about how you can use the Object Properties panel in Blender to be more accurate when placing and sizing the objects you create. So you can select an object. I'll select the default cube for this example. Then let's look at our options in the Object Properties panel on the right. For now, let's just look under the Transform dropdown. From there, you can type in the exact location using the X, Y, and Z coordinates and press Enter or Return for the changes to take effect. Note that this will be calculated as the distance from the origin, or where the axis lines cross, based on the units you set up in the previous tip. There are also options to specify the exact rotation degrees and the scale of your object. When you edit the scale in the Object Properties panel, know that the numbers in the X, Y, and Z fields are multipliers, meaning numbers you input there will multiply the scale based on the existing dimensions. Speaking of dimensions, what if you want to specify those? Well, here's a trick. Press the N key on your keyboard and the Transform menu will slide in. It will have all the same information as the Transform dropdown in the Object Properties panel, except it also has the dimensions. This allows you to type in precise dimensions for your object. Just remember to press Enter or Return on your keyboard after you've entered the values and you're all set. All right, so far we've discussed how to precisely edit an object that you've already created. But is there a faster way to do it while you're actually building? That leads me to the next tip. Number three, type measurements and dimensions on the fly. Whether you're moving, scaling, or rotating entire objects in object mode, or using the same transformation tools to edit vertices, edges, and faces in edit mode, you'll often want to be able to more quickly specify dimensions on the fly. And you can do that by typing the desired values on your keyboard while in the middle of using a tool. Let's try it. Select the default cube and press G to begin moving it. Now, while in the middle of moving it, type 2 on your keyboard, and you'll see that the cube jumps two units in the X direction. If that's what you want, press Enter or Return to complete the move. Or use the Backspace or Delete key on your keyboard, then type a new number if you want to move it a different distance. Now, what if you actually wanted to move it the opposite way, or along the Y or Z direction? You can control all of these options with your keyboard. Typing a positive number will move your object in the positive X direction. Typing a minus sign before the number will move it in the negative direction. And at any time before or after typing a number, press the Y or Z key on your keyboard to change one of those directions. And the great thing is that most of the tools in Blender work this way. For example, the numbers you type while using the rotate tool will set a specific rotation in degrees, and the numbers you type while using the scale tool will act as a multiplier of the existing dimensions. 
Even when using the tools in edit mode, you can type in measurements and dimensions as you edit the vertices, edges, and faces. I recommend experimenting with typing in values on your keyboard as you work with the different tools to get a feel for what dimensions and adjustments you're able to specify on the fly. And if you want to double check that everything was inputted correctly, that's where our next tip comes in. Number four, take measurements. Real quick, before we get too much further, we're covering a lot of ground in this video, so I've gone ahead and put together a free set of notes that will make it easy for you to review everything. I've added a link to download them in the description. OK, let's talk about measurements in Blender. While there is the underlying grid that can help you estimate the general size of things, you do have options to be more accurate when it comes to measuring things in your scene. One quick trick that will allow you to easily verify the dimensions of your geometry is to toggle on measurement overlays. To do that, first, make sure you're in edit mode. You can press the tab key on your keyboard to toggle back and forth between object mode and edit mode. Then, in the top right corner of your 3D viewport, click on the drop down next to the Overlays menu. Then, under Measurement, check the box or boxes next to the values you want to show. Now, nothing will happen at first, but while still in Edit Mode, click, hold down, and drag a selection window around your object, and anything you select will show a measurement overlay. That's great for being able to quickly check that things in your model are built with the correct dimensions. But what if you need to take a measurement of something else? That's where the measure tool comes in, which is kind of like a tape measure you can use to measure anything in your viewport. Let's try it. Select the measure tool, click and hold down on a spot in your model, then drag to another spot and let go to create a measurement. Using the tool in this way is great for grabbing quick, rough measurements. But there are a few things that can be confusing and frustrating about this tool that you should know. First, if you click on another tool, the measurement disappears. If you want to bring the measurement back up, you can pick the measure tool again. But that's not a great solution if you want a persistent measurement for reference. If that's something you do need, I recommend checking out the Measure It add-on. It's a bit too much to cover in this video, but if you want to learn more about Measure It or add-ons in general, head over to our website and send me a quick message or leave a comment below and I'd be happy to help you out. All right, the other thing that trips people up with the Measure tool is that by default, the measurement seems kind of approximate rather than exact. And when you orbit, the measurement isn't attached to anything and it seems to just be floating in space. Well, it turns out that there's a feature in Blender we can turn on to be more precise with the Measure tool and many of Blender's other tools as well. And that feature is the focus of our next tip. Number five, enable snapping. Snapping, which refers to the ability to automatically infer important points in your model, is a feature that you'll want to use all the time in Blender. As an example, let's take a look at how snapping works using the Measure tool we just discussed. Pick the Measure tool again, only this time, Hold down the control key on your keyboard as you hover near the vertex of an edge. You'll notice a circle attached to your cursor that snaps to the vertex. Click and hold down, and with the control key still held down, drag the cursor to the other vertex till it snaps, then let go. Now you have an exact measurement from vertex to vertex. And because you snap the measurement, when you orbit, it remains attached to those exact points. All right, now let's dig a little deeper into how snapping will come in handy with so much more than just the measure tool when you're concerned with modeling precisely and accurately in Blender. In the quick example we just covered, we use the control key as a handy shortcut to enable snapping while in the middle of using a tool. And that works with many of the tools in Blender. But let's take a look at the snapping menu to see some of our other options as well. First, you can click on the magnet icon here to toggle snapping on and off globally. The keyboard shortcut for this option is to press the Shift and Tab keys together. Under the drop-down arrow, there are a few additional options for how to snap that we can set as well. By default, snapping is set to increment, which means things will snap based on your grid increments. This is super handy, and we'll talk more about why in a moment. You'll also see the options for vertex, edge, and face snapping, which you can toggle on when you need to snap things to specific vertices, edges, or faces. Also note that you can hold down the shift key and click on more than one snapping option to enable multiple modes at once. And when you have it set to vertex, edge, and or face, you'll see that the snap with option below defaults to closest. So if you're using the move tool, that means it will snap to the closest vertex from the object you're moving to the vertex you're snapping to. Now, if it jumps to somewhere you didn't want, I recommend moving the object without snapping turned on so that the vertices you do want to snap together are close to one another. Then turn snapping back on and it should snap to where you want. Also note that when you select the different snapping modes in the dropdown, it defaults to only affecting the move tool. But you can toggle snapping on for rotate and scale here as well. And know that snapping isn't just a handy feature while working in object mode, you can use it in edit mode as well. If you've enabled snapping globally by clicking the magnet icon, then when you switch to edit mode, it'll automatically be on. 
If not, you can also use the same control key as a shortcut to enable snapping on the fly while using a tool in edit mode. Now, one thing I always recommend at this point to my students is to experiment with all the different snapping options and settings to see how they work on a blank project. That way, you can get the hang of how they function before diving in and trying to use them on a real project where something unexpected might happen that throws you off or leads to frustrating consequences. Snapping is a feature you'll use all the time as you model in Blender. So take the time to really learn how it works now. Your future self will definitely thank you. Hello, Alex. It's you from the future. Just wanted to say thanks. All right. Our next tip starts to bring together all the features we've covered so far to help you model more accurately in Blender. Number six, leverage orthographic views. What's an orthographic view? That just means a view that is perpendicular to the x, y, or z axis direction, or what might more commonly be called top down or plan views, front, back, left, or right, or side elevation views. All right, but how do these views help you model more accurately in Blender? As anyone who's used Blender professionally can tell you, it's tricky to manipulate objects in free floating 3D space, adjusting things precisely where and how you intend to. For instance, you might move an object so it appears lined up, only to orbit and realize it's actually floating in space nowhere near where you meant for it to go. And that's where utilizing orthographic views can not only help you manipulate things with precision, so you can be sure that things are lining up exactly as you want them, but also save you a ton of time and frustration. Let's talk about how with a simple example. In a new Blender file with just the default cube, let's jump to an orthographic view aligned with the y-axis. There are a few ways we can do this. If you have a keyboard with a number pad to the right, not the numbers across the top you get with all keyboards, but the number pad on the right that you get with extended keyboards, tap the one key. This is the shortcut for the y-axis view. Note that you can grab a top-down or z-axis view by hitting seven on the number pad or an x-axis view by hitting three. And if you hold down the control key while pressing the number on the number pad, it will jump to the opposite side, such as going from a top-down view to a bottom-up. Now, if you don't have a keyboard with a number pad, don't worry, you have two other options. First, you can simply click on the Y in the navigation gizmo, and that will jump you to an orthographic view aligned with the Y axis. Click the Y a second time, and it will flip around to the opposite side. This works with the X and Z directions as well. But another option is to hold down the Alt key if you're on a PC, or the Option key if you're on a Mac. Then press and hold down on your center mouse button. Now swipe your mouse to the right, and Blender will automatically jump to the orthographic Y axis view. You can continue to swipe right, left, up, or down in this manner to switch to different orthographic views. While this may seem a little clunky at first, being able to just quickly swipe your mouse to get to an orthographic view can be super handy and save you a ton of time while you're modeling. All right, once we're in an orthographic view, notice how the cube is halfway below the ground plane? Well, what if we want to move it up so it's resting precisely on the ground plane? Making sure we're in object mode, select the cube, toggle on snapping, and check that it's set to increment. Press G for the Move tool and start to move the cube up. A handy shortcut to know is that you can also lock the X, Y, or Z direction by pressing that key on your keyboard while using a tool. So here, we could lock our movement to only be along the Z axis by hitting Z on our keyboard. All right, continue to move the cube until it snaps so that the base is in line with the Y axis and click to end the move. And now the cube is resting exactly on the ground plane. Of course, as you need to manipulate more complex objects with precision, you'll often need to toggle through multiple orthographic views as you make adjustments to get exactly what you need. But being comfortable with the fundamentals of how to work with these views will set you up for much greater success than trying to do the same types of adjustments while in a 3D perspective view. All right, we've laid the groundwork for working with orthographic views. You're ready for the next tip. Number seven, master object origins. For every mesh object in Blender, you'll see a little orange dot in its center. That's the object's origin point. The location of that origin point determines the object's position in 3D space, and it's critical to how the object will behave once transformed. So understanding how object origins function and when you might want to edit them is fundamental to more accurately creating and manipulating your models. Let's go back to the default cube example we just looked at. With the cube resting on the ground plane, press S for the scale tool and scale it up. Now the cube is larger, but some of it is below the ground plane again. This kind of misalignment can be super frustrating if you spent the effort to position something accurately, only to have an adjustment like a scale or a rotation throw it completely off. The problem or reason why this happened is that our default cube's origin is centered inside its volume. So any transformations we make to the cube, such as scaling or rotating, happen around that center point. So in this example, we want the cube to scale while keeping the bottom precisely aligned to the ground. How would we do that? 
by moving the origin point within the cube so the origin itself rests on the ground plane. That way, when we scale up, the transformation happens from that point rather than the center of the cube. Let's try it. We'll undo back to before we scaled the cube. Then let's select the 3D cursor tool. We'll talk more about why we use this tool in a bit, but first switch back to a y-axis orthographic view. And again, we'll make sure we have snapping turned on. Let's toggle snapping to vertex mode, then hold the shift key and click and hold down on your right mouse button, not the left one, the right one, and move your mouse toward the bottom corner of the cube until it snaps to the corner vertex. Then let go of everything. Shift, right click is the shortcut for placing the 3D cursor where you clicked. And clicking, holding down, and dragging with snapping turned on is how you can ensure it snaps precisely to where you want. Now that you've set the 3D cursor to the corner vertex of the cube, we can use that position to update the object origin point. To do that, in the object menu, under Set Origin, select the option for Set Origin to 3D Cursor. And now you should see the orange origin dot move to the corner vertex. Now let's try transforming the cube again. As you can see, any scaling or rotating we do happens about our new origin point. All right, now you know the seven key things you need to do to model with precision and accuracy in Blender. What's next? From here, it's definitely possible to learn things on your own. But if you can't afford to waste time or pick up bad habits, I recommend checking out our complete intro to Blender course, where you'll learn everything you need to know to begin creating 3D models in Blender the right way. Head over to our website and try our courses for free. And if you're not ready to try our courses just yet, be sure to check out one of the videos in this playlist. Until next time, happy blending. Hello, Alex. It's you from the future. Hello, Alex. Hello, Alex. It's you from the future.